Justice <laughs> Shri Santosh Hegde, Mr. T.P. Srinivasan, Mr. Srikanth Sudhanaran, my dear friend Namrata Samra, dignitaries on the stage, ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, I would like to thank the CII and of course the Young India Forum for giving me this unique opportunity to speak to you on a very important topic, as you all know, which pertains to governance in this country. There is no doubt that it is a very important topic, extremely relevant to each one of us, especially to a large section of the audience who are young and who form the promise of tomorrow for our nation. But before I embark on this topic, let me also thank Naveen for that generous introduction of me and my naval career. Today when I speak about governance, obviously I would be basing it on the values and experience that I have had in the 36 years of service that I did with the Indian Navy. You may appreciate that in the armed forces, one is reasonably insulated from the civilian life. And much of the normal interaction that a citizen has to necessarily go through while interacting with government functionaries and institutions is limited. Nevertheless, it is adequate enough to form an impression of the current status and compare it with a desirable cluster of qualities in our social life, which governance, of course, is expected to realize. But then what exactly are we looking for in quality of life from a common citizen? I think he or she, as has been said before, needs unfettered access to good education, good health care, be able to seek employment prospects, enjoy a clean environment which en encompasses safe drinking water, sanitation, unpolluted air, and finally, of course, feel safe and secure in this society. You will agree with me that these tenets can be achieved in a country only if its resources are well managed through effective governance <coughs> in various areas of public systems. And that is exactly what we expect out of the government and public institutions through their effective governance, especially since we have peculiar characteristics of our cultural diversity and multiple strata structure in our society. I know that Mr. Srinivasan did mention about the Western countries giving definitions for good governance. But nevertheless, the one given by the World Bank in 1992 is pretty relevant even today. It is most appropriate, I think, to the discussion today, and I quote, it is the manner in which power is exercised in the management of a country's economic and social resources for development." Unquote. As earlier mentioned, the World Bank report also said that governance needs to be predictable, transparent, reasonable, and should foster unambiguous accountability. And all of this within a framework of a sound legal system. Needless to say, the bureaucracy should imbibe work ethos of professionalism and fairness, while the judicial system should correct deviations that are either noticed or reported. Apart from that, we need a free press and a very strong and resilient civil society. Much of this has been implemented for many years and has been functioning to some level of efficiency. But when these are integrated together, 
you would agree with me. There seems to be a deficiency of some common ingredient in our institutions and individuals building power. So let us try and understand this better in the light of the dynamics of governance. Governance of, of a society has systemic links with the ethics of social life. It is said that an institution without ethics is like a body without a soul. Good governance, therefore, has to enable individuals and institutions to do good for the common man, while at the same time find it difficult to do any evil. All this is realizable only if functionaries of a public organization follow a code of conduct, which consolidates ethics across the rank and file of the organization. Many corporates in this country have a code of conduct very well structured to ensure that honesty, accuracy, fairness, compliance of rules and regulations, and accountability thrive in their organizations. Similar codes of conduct also exist in the government. The natural question that comes to one's mind, therefore, is, is it being complied with? And if not, why does it happen so? We all have been reading about Durga Nagpal and Ashok Khemkhan in India as shining examples of individuals upholding ideas of, ideals of good governance. Maybe there are many more of whom we haven't heard about. And chances are, there are also, I would guess, many who do not follow any code of conduct that is expected out of them. Now, does this happen due to coercion or malignant intention or just benign neglect of one's duties? Every case of Alphians may seem to be different in its appearance, manifestation, structure, scope and composition, but definitely there is a common layer of mistrust, low morality, greed and deprivation. I would like to think that most of this stems from low or inadequate level of morality existing in our society. It reminds me of the President of India's address to the nation on the eve of Republic Day of 2013 when he said that it is time our society's moral compass needs to be reset as it has drifted away from its desirable and noble direction. Obviously, this moral compass has shifted in slow time. Perhaps under the adverse influence of technological advancements, like in the case of IT, or due to political overbearing of our public institutions, thereby corrupting individual behavior of many of our authorities in power. Cause correction needs intense efforts by many agencies, institutions, and individuals. But before I talk about that, let us remember that we belong to a country which has been steeped in rich traditions of good governance. In school, most of us would have definitely learned about Emperor Ashoka's period of golden rule in 250 BC and the edicts which are carved in stone at Bhuvaneshwar for all of us to read. Today, many historians and statesmen quote this period of golden days of good governance. Now, what is important is that we should not be expecting only the government to undertake the moral cleansing process. It has to be the onerous duty of every institution and the society. No doubt, the major role is that of the government, to ensure that harm is prevented to people and their property by establishing rules for good conduct and rule of the land. As citizens, 
We have a right to remain safe and pursue happiness. But these can have no legal guarantee. But we are going to achieve it without depriving others of their liberty and their property. Governments of the day, I'm sure, are aware of the situation. And as Justice Hegarty did mention, they have tried to correct the drift in our moral compass by constituting administrative reforms commissions. To start with in 1964, as he mentioned, but then it took four decades to constitute the second reforms commission. A series of improvements have been identified. We are making small steps towards correcting our moral compass. And these are getting transformed into law. The right to information is one. The right to education is yet another example. And considerable impetus is being given to these efforts by technological advancements in information sharing and mass communication. Of course, a lot needs to be done to render our public institutions more effective and transparent. Now, being a doctor, let me suggest a few examples where effective governance can be brought about in the health sector. Firstly, it is about the quality of drugs and pharmaceuticals. Today, a particular drug composition is available under different names, manufactured by different companies, and their prices vary over a very wide range. The less expensive ones are invariably from small companies, whereas the ones come from large and reputed companies. Now very often, the low-priced ones do not meet the, requ the requisite quality standards in their regular production to start with, because such firms do not have adequate in-house test facilities or inadequate quality control. Further. The infrastructure required for testing drugs in public institutions is not available in all states in this country. Nevertheless, these firms compete for the supply of medicines to government hospitals and they become successful at times because they form the proverbial L1. Finally, these low quality medicines find their way to the storehouses of government hospitals who are expected to provide free medicines to patients. <coughs> Those patients who can afford to buy medicines from the market, mostly from reputed firms, do not use the government supply, while the poor who have no money are dependent on government supply, even if it is of low quality and most of the time ineffective. In short, we fail to provide quality health care to the underprivileged. Further, taxpayers' money is frivolously spent on poor quality medicines. I would think that this is an important area where speedy improvement to governance is required not only by drug regulatory bodies but also by small enterprises who supply such medicines. The second example I would like to cite, and this is something that Mr. Nawaz did mention, is about the disposal of waste, and in this case, hospital waste. Here, the law is in place. The government of India brought out a Gazette notification in 1998 regarding the method of disposal of hospital waste. But the implementation is extremely poor in our country primarily because of the obsolete technology we are employing. Today, hospital bio-waste needs to be buried and covered by concrete layers periodically or burned in silos. However, non-availability of land and the huge effort required to comply with the law often encourages service providers to these hospitals to surreptitiously dispose them off in open spaces, even if they have to go to the neighboring state. I say this because recently, the state of Kerala has received a lot of flack for the amount of hospital waste being dumped in Coimbatore. 
In comparison to India, Western countries have inducted suitable technologies for, to dispose of hospital waste in the form of class mark violators, thereby rendering adequate protection to, in the environment and not endangering public health. I think that this is yet another area where our government needs to pursue corrective action soon to ensure that our environment is clean and safe for several generations to come. I am compelled to say that it is not only bio-waste that requires the drastic improvement in our country, but also domestic garbage, both in our rural and urban areas. One just has to drive along NH47 to see the amount of domestic garbage that is just flung on either side of the road. The situation is grim and a solution needs to emerge as soon as possible. If only citizens can cooperate with public bodies endeavouring to cope up with this task. There are some well-meaning entrepreneurs who are trying to make headway in this but it needs a national movement. As rightly mentioned by Mr. Nawaz, even the state of Kerala stands to lose a huge amount of revenue if this comes out in the international press about how we dispose of garbage in the state. Civic sense and morality of every single individual is important to us to evolve a pragmatic scheme. There is there are many more examples in the healthcare sector. Another disturbing one is about how, even though we doctors do take the oath of Hippocrates when we pass out of college and promise to treat all people equally, we tend to forget that when it comes to trying to make a lot of money, either in a private hospital or in private practice. A lot of unnecessary investigations are done on patients when they don't need them. It doesn't lead to a diagnostic uh, conclusion. We are forgetting our own clinical skills and relying only on the latest diagnostic machines. We tend to overdose our patients. We tend to treat them unnecessarily causing complications. This is not something that I'm proud of. This is something which we need to have a rethink about, realize that there are many people who can't afford treatment in this country. We have tuberculosis raising its head, becoming resurgent in this country, and it is not only because of AIDS, it is because of unnecessary medication, it is because of improper prescription, probably due to poor compliance by patients also, but we as doctors have a very large role to play and that is where we need to realize that we can change the situation if we wish to do so. I have cited only a few examples from the healthcare sector and, but similarly, there may be so many more from other areas where good governance needs to be realized by joint efforts of the government, public institutions, industries, and society at large. All of us are responsible citizens. We have a meaningful role to play towards improving the quality of life in our society. I would not like to take much more time because I think we're already running short of time. I think in conclusion, I would like to say that, government, that governance is not synonymous with only the government, even though the government has a very large role to play. As mentioned earlier, each one of us has to strive to become a responsible citizen, naturally with a high moral order in our everyday life. Needless to say, this should happen automatically based on the values that elders have passed on to us and the social values that society has maintained. Undoubtedly, the quality of parenting is very, very important at home. And moral education in school and colleges have a permanent impact on each individual's 
imbibing of a moral order. To many of the younger generations in the audience, I appeal, please fulfill your duty towards the next generation, not only at home, but also at work and in society. But in the end, let me recount that good governance can result only if all of us, as responsible citizens, committed members of the society, and in some cases, as empowered authorities in public institutions, strive towards maintaining a high moral order. Let's hope that we can build India through perseverant and tireless efforts for our next generation to have a better quality of life. Jai Hind.